Good afternoon. You're all very welcome to our webinar today on sustainability reporting and ESG. So this webinar is being recorded and we will share a recording afterwards as well as up uploading it to our client solutions hub. And we'll share that link afterwards. So my name is Kathleen O'Regan. I'm Senior Executive in the Sustainability, Agritech and Renewable Energy Department. Um, I manage our, our green transition funds. And we have over, or just under, should I say, 400 attendees registered for today's webinar. So I think it just goes to show the appetite and the interest in sustainability reporting and, and ESG. It can be a very, I suppose, complex area for, for companies to understand and get their head around in terms of you know the wide range um, of frameworks, of certifications, of verifications and pledges and disclosure platforms that are out there. But hopefully today's webinar will bring some clarity to that. We have a really great lineup of, of speakers and I'm delighted to be able to welcome today Brian O'Kennedy, who is Managing Director of Clearstream Solutions, Peter McDonald, who is ESG Advisory Partner in Iser Ampner, Ireland, and Des Ferris, who is Founder, MD of Sustainable Winning Performance. So Brian is going to give an overview of sustainability and ESG reporting frameworks and standards to date. And also then on the future of ESG reporting regulations, specifically the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, CSRD, and what makes good sustainability reporting. Brian will then facilitate a panel discussion with Peter and, and with Des. So Brian is CEO of Clearstream Solutions, which is a leading carbon management and corporate sustainability advisory firm, which he founded in 2009. Brian has over 20 years leadership experience in the global supply chain management and procurement, particularly in the areas of IT, media, print and packaging. Brian has served as chair of the CDP Ireland Network, the Global Carbon Reporting Programme, formerly known as Carbon Disclosure Project, and is also a member of the steering committee of the Global Responsible Sourcing Standard. Peter leads Eisner Ampers Ireland's ESG compliance and reporting services and advises clients on embedding ESG and sustainability within their strategy, operations and reporting. With 30 years audit and advisory leadership experience, Peter served as a partner with the big four in Ireland and internationally. Des is the founder and managing director of Sustainable Winning Performance, a consultancy firm helping organizations to achieve their commercial ambition while ensuring they actively contribute to a more sustainable future aligned to science. Des has over 22 years experience in the fast moving consumer goods sector and has held positions as MD, board member and director. And most recently, Des was the sustainability director or leading on sustainability in Keelings, a company that we're all familiar with. So it's great to have Brian, to Peter and Des here today. We have a really great lineup with, with huge experience in this area. And hopefully we'll all have some uh, nuggets, uh, new nuggets of information learned as, as uh, in as we leave in, in an hour. So Brian, I'm going to hand over to you now. I'm going to stop sharing my slides. Thanks very much, Kathleen. And uh, I believe we are going to uh, take questions at the end. So if yes, people want to- Thank you questions. for that, Brian. Yeah, I forgot to mention, we've, there's a and a feature um, at, the, at the bottom of your screen. So at any time during the, the, the next hour, put your questions in there and, and we'll hopefully have time at the end to come to them. So thanks, thanks Brian, for that. I'll hand back over no to you. No problem. So are you seeing my slide screen now? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, so uh, delighted to be here. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, one of the phrases we came across very early in the in the days of sustainability um, was this, uh, I can't remember who I can attribute the phrase to, but was that financial reporting tells us how a company did in the past. But ESG or sustainability reporting tells us how a company is going to do in the future. Um, and I think a very powerful phrase in the context of what we're trying to do now, which is to grapple with the, the whole process of, of, uh, of disclosure and reporting. There is a, uh, obviously, so I'm going to stop share for a second. Sorry, my slides are not moving forward. So one tick, I'll just put it on this. Okay, display, hopefully that works. 
Um, by way of introduction, um, we Clearstream have been around for about 15 years or so in the business. Um, the eagle eye of you will notice that um, there's a little line through independent because as of yesterday, we announced that we have been acquired or at least a majority stake in Clearstream has been acquired by Goodbody, who they themselves are part of AIB. So not by way of telling that story, but actually it's interesting now that you see financial institutions and banks looking to invest in ESG business uh, and in ESG businesses is a symptom of, of how important uh, the whole process is. The other thing of note about our client base is that when we started out in sustainability and ESG, this was very much the preserve of the large corporates, big multinationals, big companies, PLCs. That's dramatically different now. We have a large number of what we would term SME clients who are really trying to, one, demonstrate their sustainability through either their customers that are asking them these questions, tenders and, 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 uh, and RFPs, investors and banks that are asking them the questions, and also their employees. Um, so there's a real competitive environment now around sustainability and, and kudos to Enterprise Ireland in looking to try and develop the capabilities of Irish companies in this space because it is now a competitive issue for businesses. Um, so what I'm going to cover today over the next 20 minutes or so is to try and do what's a little challenging, which is to cover all of the breadth and range of what is in ESJ, the context and the trends, and then to talk about why reporting is important. Um, what's the evolution and disclosure of, of, of a maturity around reporting um, and, and talk a little bit about the frameworks and standards. And as Kathleen mentioned, I'm going to try in a short space of time to cover the, uh, the, the CSRD or at least give you an introduction to what that is. Uh, and, and as always, the highlight um, of the discussion will be the conversation with Peter and Des, two expert practitioners in this space. So, so why are we looking to disclose and, and report on investment? Well, we see three main reasons why companies are looking to, to report on ESG. One is that there are some compliance and risk issues, and we will talk about the European legislation shortly. But again, businesses that are doing a good job in terms of organizing the com compliance and risk need to be able to demonstrate that, whether it's through standards or certifications. So there's a compliance and risk issue. From an operational perspective, there's a lot of benefits in terms of, of, of ESG. Obviously, if we reduce our carbon emissions, we're reducing cost. I mentioned banks and financial institutions are offering lower cost loans. And you had the session last week on financing the transition, which is key. And you'll see the banks are offering better, um, better terms to companies that have more interesting sustainability stories and products. Um, and then there's the whole resource efficiency reduce cost, reduce materials, reduce cost. And finally, there's the driver of value. And this is where the most interesting piece really is. As I said, it's a competitive issue now, whether it's the brand of the business, whether we're trying to attract talent and people, whether it's management teams trying to drive strategy and innovation, whether it's the investors looking to put their money into more sustainable, or whether it's marketplaces looking for sustainable products. These are all key drivers of a business now going forward and the ability to be able to communicate and articulate and report on your sustainability performance is going to be key to that. What's behind that? We're consultants. We love trends. Uh, businesses are now being measured not just on their financial performance, but they're being measured on their ESG value. What value do they bring to society and what's the impact that society has on their building business? I'll talk about materiality shortly. We're all going in a similar direction in terms of climate ambition. 2050, it's a long way away. It's a bit too far for most of us. I'll hopefully be still around in 2050. But in the context of, of a direction of travel, it's very clear we need to decarbonize and all businesses need to have a clear plan, an articulated plan as to how they're going to decarbonize. They also need to be able to talk about where the climate risks are in their business. Is carbon, is climate change a risk to your business or effectively are you a business that can help with the transition? What's the impact of weather related issues on your business going forward? You need to be able to articulate that. But you need to do that in a way that is not overly, uh, let's say, ambitious in terms of your green claims. And there's new EU legislation, the Green Claims Directive, coming down the track, which will mean companies are expected to provide credible, uh, authentic, verifiable uh, evidence in terms of, of their green claims. 
We're going to talk a little bit about legislation, so I'm not going to get into it too much detail, but the EU has been very clever here in terms of legislation. Normally, legislation is something that comes along once everybody sort of moved. It, it hoovers up the laggards. You know, all the, all the ambitious people have moved on. Those that are, are slow to move finally get caught by legislation. In this space, it's very different. In fact, the EU legislation is quite ambitious. And in fact, it's driving us and dragging us along in, in a particular area. So it's it's very far reaching and it's most interesting. Um, the CS triple D will require us to look at our in, on our supply chains and ensure that not just our own internal businesses, but our supply chains. And this is really key for many of you on the on the. You may not be subject to the CSRD yourself or the CS triple D, but if your customers are, then effectively it will become quasi legislative for you because if it's a requirement for them to address these issues in their supply chain they're coming after you. Obviously, there's an opportunity and a risk here that investors are very conscious. Or we see this particularly in the construction sector and other sectors that are very susceptible to, to climate impacts. There's a clear link between investment ESG and ESG performance. The investors are after ESG assets. I was at a conference this morning and I asked the audience how many of them had set targets in their business, uh, sustainability targets, and about half the audience put their hand up. And then I said, how many of you have them linked to the remuneration in your business? One out of about 100 people there. So we have a disjoint between the targets that we're setting as a top level corporate perspective and our performance on the ground of what we're incentivizing our people to do. And finally, the other big trend we see in reporting is reporting on nature. So carbon has been the big issue, some of the social workplace, gender pay gap and so forth. But biodiversity and natural capital and, and nature are the increasingly important topics. And we're seeing that come through in some of the reporting requirements now. So this is just a flavor of, of some of the things that are happening. Um, ESG, so just want to mention, like we don't particularly like the term ESG. It was invented by the, um, the investors and the financial community so that they could box off what is a very wide and noisy uh, area. But you know, sustainability is a confusing topic for a lot of people. We like the term responsible business, but let's use ESG for the moment because it's increasingly becoming the framework that companies are reporting. So understanding what's covered in terms of environment and climate, in terms of your E, and then your society. So the S tends to have an, an outward look, which is the external responsible sourcing community, customer welfare, and an internal S, which is around workplace and workforce. And then we have the governance, which essentially is the hygiene and making sure that we're, we're addressing the structure and, and performance of the rest of the, the business in terms of independence, in terms of regulatory compliance, et cetera. And obviously none of this happens without the financial pillar. So in terms of reporting, I want to talk a little bit about reporting. I don't know many of you on the, on, on the group have actually produced sustainability reports or put some stuff out on your website or put some things in tenders. So traditionally, it was a voluntary activity. We used non-specific frameworks. Um, we used hard, historic data uh, such as carbon emissions. We reported typically based on information and standalone sustainability. So sustainability was separate from our financial reporting. Companies kind of self-selected what they reported and what data they reported on. We saw very few metrics. I saw a sustainability re report produced by a financial institution who will remain nameless uh, some years back with no metrics, none at all. It was their first report, but it was all about everybody come together and nice pictures and our directional stuff. So we need, you know, there was, there was lack of metrics, very difficult to, to compare data and limited engagement with stakeholders. That's all changed. So the future, where are we going? It's going to be a mandatory activity and it, it's going to be similar to finance. It's going to allow us to be to, to have equal standards and comparability on sustainability information. There will be common mandatory standards. Now, I'm not saying that everybody's going to be doing the same thing. No, this is a competitive space. So it doesn't mean that everybody's going to be doing the same thing and we'll all be at the same standard. No, it means that we have a structure for reporting. We're still going to have to show that we're better than the other girl or the other guy. Historic performance, we're gonna move, it's gonna be plus financial for looking forward. So when we talk about what we've done in the past, we need to be able to talk about what the implications are for us going forward. 
Our information is going to have to be disclosed in management reports. It's going to have to be digitally tagged. It's going to be third party assured. It'll need to be material. It'll need to be focused on the things that are important to our business. And scope three data, which is that big gray area of all this indirect stuff in our value chains upstream and downstream, is going to be critical to reporting because that's about how we're engaging with our value chain and our affected stakeholders. Don't get too hung up on this particular slide, but I just want you to think about the journey. I know it's an old rehash phrase that this is a journey, um, but in, in the case of reporting, it is. And, and we've given you in this a sort of a, a roadmap to, to going from being potentially a follower or a laggard in this space where our reporting is very much focused on compliance to one where as a leader, we're able to articulate and drive value and all of our, it's a competitive advantage for us as a business and leadership. So we have a lot of companies will come to us and say, oh, we want to be, we want to be leaders in sustainability. Absolutely. CEOs all over this thing. You go, well, have you thought about the process to get there? And I know Des shared a very interesting article at the Harvard Business School this morning about, about the blocks to, to, to delivering this. There's not a set of simple deliverable tasks. A lot of it requires cultural change, different mindset, different ways of buying and selling and engaging as businesses. So this is a journey you have to decide how quickly or, or slowly you want to go through it. But all along, there is a need to engage and communicate with stakeholders through credible and authentic reporting. Be interested to, to, to do a little poll, but see, typically when we do this, the people will tell us, well, we're doing lots and lots of stuff, but it's not all together in one plan. So you need that framework plan. I'm going to share that with you very shortly. Um, this is a big hodgepodge of, of different reporting standards and, and frameworks. So we just try to, just to help people understand what these are. They're different and, and us consultants throughout all these various different frameworks. So these hopefully four boxes will help you to understand what's happening in terms of sustainability and ESG reporting. On the top left hand side, you have the regulations, right? So you have the EU regulations and I'll come back to some of these CSRD, taxonomy, CSDD and SFDR for investors and reporting companies and supply chains. In almost in parallel with that, the UK government are going to have to adopt their own standards along with Brexit, and they're very much aligning with with CSRD. But they will they will have their own little tweaks and flavors. Um, the International Financial Reporting System, the IFRS uh, standards, have also developed their sustainability standards. So they brought a number of other international frameworks together to create what's now called ISSB. Some of you might have been familiar with SASB before. It's now part of International Sustainability Standards Board, ISSB. So you've got international standards, you've got EU standards, you've got UK standards, and of course the Americans have their own standards, the SEC. So not quite released yet. We're not sure which way the Americans are going. They're, they're, they're having all sorts of debate about ESG at the moment. But, but one thing that's clear is that governments are, are now starting to regulate for ESG reporting. It's no longer something that might happen. It's happening. The PLCs in Europe will have to report next year. Next year's data uh, will, will have to be reported in, in, uh, in, in 24. Uh, I'll share that with you shortly. Alongside with that are all the voluntary frameworks. So the Sustainable Development Goals, I think I gave my badge away this morning. Um, uh, task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. You've also got the ISOs. You've got Greenhouse Gas Protocol. So these are voluntary reporting frameworks and standards. The good news is that most of the legislation is starting to reflect these standards, which is good because there's a certain level of consistency. But it's not on a one-to-one -one basis. So we're still going to have frameworks and standards that organizations use for particular issues. The TNFD is a good example. That's a, na a nature risk profile that's just been, been, been launched last year. TCFD has effectively in some countries become legislation. So it's moved across to that top left and is being built into uh, government frameworks for disclosure. And that's around climate risk and opportunity. On the bottom right are the industry um, developed benchmarks and reporting platforms. So these are typically either third party organizations or charities such as CDP, which is the world's leading climate reporting platform, Ecovatus and Cedex, which are platforms that companies use to get their supply chains to report. Here in Ireland, we have programs like Green Isle. So these are sectoral, typically sectoral 
or industry-wide that companies are using to collect data from either their suppliers or in the case of science-based targets to make commitments based on what's best practice. And finally, um, even if you don't, if you're not being asked, um, there's a whole industry out there of organizations which are rating, as somebody described it once to me, that sort of rank and spank of the sustainability world, because nobody wants to get a worse rating than their, their competitors. And investors and customers are asking their business businesses to provide information, and on that basis, they're making decisions competitive decisions about where to place their business, where to invest their money. So whether we like it or not, there's a bunch of people out there who are going to rate us. Um, so what's the purpose of these legislation? So it puts effectively what we're looking is that we can see that some ESG issues are a real indicator of success for a business. And despite what you hear in the States of what's going on about, about ESG and whether they're investing and divesting, there's a very clear direction of travel here is that businesses are expected to perform and not just the financial, as I said earlier, it's a driver of value. So as an indicator of success, we need transparent, comparable, consistent data to be able to make decisions. And also it allows us to eliminate the, the greenwash. So questions that you need to ask yourselves, right? What are the business activities and how do they impact on the environment and society. So that's your business activities, the external out, from inside out. How are you measuring and mitigating your impacts, risks, and opportunities? And who are the affected stakeholders and how are you engaging with them? And if you can answer those three questions, what are your business activities and how do they impact? How are you measure, measuring and mitigating and imp those impacts? And how are you engaging with your effective stakeholders? You should have a strong sustainability articulated proposition. So finally, I just want to talk about the CSRD. What is it? It's the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. Um, it is the next version of what's been around for some time called the Non-Financial Reporting Directive. And basically it mandates the reporting of non-financial information. As I said earlier, the EU has been very clever about this. As part of the European Green Deal, there's a whole range of different initiatives. But under the EU Sustainable Finance Package, we have the focus um, for investors and uh, banks and financial institutions and insurance companies on what's called the SFDR, so that Sustainable Financial Disclosure Regulation. Using a common set of language, the EU taxonomy, they want to mirror that. At the moment, they don't quite mirror each other, but ultimately they'll get there in terms of corporate responsibility. Because you can imagine if, if an investee company, if an investor company is, is asked to measure the sustainability performance of their portfolio, or a bank is asked to describe how, how green are their loans, they can't do that unless they get the information from the corporates. So as a company, you need to be able to provide that information to your investors or your customers or your employees or any other interested stakeholders. Um, they started out with climate change and we're moving into the other areas of sustainability, pollution prevention, water, biodiversity and resource use. So who does the CSRD apply to? Um, really interesting and important thing about this is look at the small level, 250 level in, in, in 2026. So companies that are of a size of 250 employees or greater will be reporting in 2020 and 2026 on 2025 data. Um, the PLCs will go the year before, so they will report 20, next year's data in 2025. So this is imminent. Um, and obviously then there's there's a follow-on for small listed companies and, and large multinational companies later in the decade. Um, the big issue here, as I said, is not to get too hung up on the fact that whether you have 200 employees or 300 or whatever, the reality is, is as we see it, this is effectively going to become the de facto approach to sustainability disclosures and reporting. And even if you're not captured by that, your customers are gonna be asking you, your employees, the investors, the banks. So there is a set of standards, which we all will be using. There's this principle of double material, materiality, which is the inside out, outside in, plus financial and impact measures. There is a requirement for audit, which we'll come back to, which is really interesting. It's the first time ever that ESG data has been has been required for as an audit. And the reports will be digitally tagged so that you need to produce a report that can be scanned 
uh, by machine readable, which will allow us for much quicker, faster uh, review of sustainability data. Without getting into it, there's there are three levels of disclosures, uh, general, topical, um, and then you have the, 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 the pillars under the topical standards of environmental, social, and governance. Uh, there's general disclosures about the business and there are general requirements. So under these headings of environmental, social, and governance, you have to do a materiality assessment which identifies which are the key issues under each of these that you as a business need to report on. Um, and there are spe sector-specific standards coming. Sector-specific is really interesting because, again, you know, a, a food biz business versus a, a utility business will have very, very different material issues that they need to focus on. And the closer we get to sector specific standards, the more comparability we have. So you're not just to ask to disclose a range of metrics, you're also asked to disclose policies and approaches to how you're managing things. We want to see action plans. I love the theme for this particular webinar. It's about transition. What are the specific transition plans and actions that we're doing to show that we can hit our metrics? And finally, targets. What's our ambition? What's our short-term targets? What are our long-term, medium? And that dictates then in terms of risk and impact. So it's a very holistic, very clever piece of legislation and will look very daunting to many of you as we start out. There's parity. Ultimately, they're looking for parity with financial data. That's why it's critical that you get the CFO involved. Go knock at the CFO's door this afternoon, and if they're not aware of the fact that they're now on the sustainability team, give them the good news. Um, we see a huge change in terms of the resources focused on sustainability in organizations. CFO is key. They know where the, 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 the metrics and the numbers and the data, and they've been through this in finance. So make sure they're part of your team. Materiality, do the impact assessments, look outwards and look at risks and opportunities inwards. Um, the audit, this is going to be a whole new area, as I said. It'll be basically third party limited assurance for the first period for three to five years, but it will then have thereafter the same um, uh, reasonable level of assurance that financial reporting has now. Governance is key. We need to we need to we need to plan up for this. this isn't something we've done before. ESG tends to be separate, spread out all over the business. It's in HR, it's in purchasing, it's in supply chain, it's it's in operation, it's everywhere in our business. So bringing that all together in structure and having proper data um, is, is key. The boards, management teams, and all the rest will ultimately be incentivized on the basis of this performance. So we need to put those schemes in place and we need to start building ESG into everybody's job spec and role. And then the transition plans, because ultimately ambition and policies are all very great, but we need to show what it is we're doing. Um, I'm not going to get into details about the materiality because it can be a little complex, but suffice it to say, you need to look at the business risks and opportunities and the effect from a financial perspective on your business. Many companies have already done that. Um, impact on your stakeholders and, and single materiality. But from a double materiality perspective, we need to look at the dependencies that we have on the environment and society because they will affect our ability to do business. And we need to look at the impact that we have on environment and society. Last couple of points is just data. So people get really worried about data. Data is challenging. ESG data is very challenging. We don't have the systems, as I said, we don't have the processes. The idea of having accurate scope three data, it's just not there. We don't have enough of it. So being able to manage that uncomfortable situation between estimates and extrapolations, sector averages, and how we drive towards collecting primary data the likelihood is that we're going to see more and more companies use tools, more and more companies used um, audit tools to prepare in, in advance. And, and, and we're going to see more and more companies have to go and, and get methodologies and sectors as to how they've, they've actually captured their ESG data. Many of you are already responding to CDP or Ecovadis or all of these other networks. And it's useful for you to sit down and start to just map out where are the data points across your your all of your reporting so you're probably reporting a bunch of these things already if you're in origin green you probably are collecting and reporting so it's good to look and see what data you have already and then you can decide whether to go with internal tools or external tools 
Last few tips in terms of sustainability reporting. Think about the material issues, think about the stakeholders, risks and impacts I mentioned, opportunities, management, governance, and data. So going forward, one of the fears that I have is that everybody's focused on reporting and the actual function of reporting and producing a report and, and a CSRD report being aligned. The reality is we still need people to be brave, collaborative, engage, and make the change. And we've had a number of clients say they've had to divert resources away from actually doing stuff to the, the communications piece. So um, I, I'd be interested to hear how they got, what the guys think about that one. But clear governance and management, commitment aligned with values. Our reporting needs to be complete and material. What are the important things? Ask your audience, do surveys, stakeholder engagement. You'll be surprised. People like to be asked, your customers like to be asked, your employees like to be asked, your suppliers like to be asked. Robust data collection and verification is gonna be, is going to be really important. Follow the methodologies that are there and try and coordinate them together. But it's not the methodology, not the report that's your sustainability. Own the topic yourselves from a bottom up and then whoever comes at you for whatever piece of data or for whatever policy or problem, you will have that. So don't just build your sustainability on what somebody's gonna ask you to report. Build it on the basis of what it means to your business. Evidence of policy and performance is key and the challenges. Talk about challenges that you're having. It's really authentic. CRH did a great job a few years back in their sustainability reports. And here's what we're doing. Here's our targets. Here's the initiatives. Here are the challenges that we have. It's, it builds a lot of trust and authenticity in your reporting. And that's really key in terms of, of being authentic. I, I won't go through this in any detail, but people say, well, can you give me a, a framework or a structure for actually doing a sustainability report? So this hopefully will give you, you know, something which allows you to, to build out your sustainability report, but typically targets and metrics up front. CEO statement is critical that you've got the board on board, your purpose, your materiality, your governance structure, your stakeholder engagement. What are your sustainability pillars? What are we doing in terms of recognition and verification, a management system and an appendix? And that's it for me. And I'm probably a couple of minutes behind, but not too far. Um, so um, I'm going to ask at this point for Peter and Des uh, to join me on screen. So let me see if I can, uh, if I stop sharing, I guess, probably a good thing. We won't see her. Fantastic. And I think you're both still on mute, gentlemen. And I know neither of you are shy and quiet. So we'll have a, hopefully have a good, a good, uh, Good conversation. So thanks for joining. Um, I suppose we'll start with something maybe pretty basic. It's just, you, you know, your, your understanding from your organization. Maybe we start with you, Peter, just in, in terms of how sustainability reporting is, is viewed at Eisner Amper. And I think you may have produced a sustainability report or certainly you're in the process of doing that. Um, you know, why is it important to you as, as, a, as a company? And maybe obviously in terms of what Eisner Amper does, just for the audience, you might explain that. Yeah, thank you very much, Brian, and uh, great to be part of this. Um, so very briefly, Eisner Amper is a professional services firm um, focused on um, audit, accounting, and tax services and advisory services in Ireland. And we're part of a global network as well, so you can spend more on that. For Eisner Amper, we believe that embracing ESG is, is not just a choice, but it's actually an ethical obligation. So we put sustainability right into our mission statement. Um, our mission statement includes a statement that says we design and deliver sustainable services and solutions for our clients. Um, that's, and that's, I think, very important for companies to bear in mind. You know, if sustainability is a buck in your strategic plan, then I think you've got it wrong. Sustainability needs to be really integrated into everything that you do from the very top, from mission, strategy, and application all the way through. Uh, yeah, it's very interesting, Peter, because um, I think a lot of businesses sometimes are a little uncomfortable about, um, you know, they're, they're more comfortable to talk about what sustainability means to their business. But when you ask them to go and talk about about their products and services and how the products and services can actually help from a, their, their customers from a sustainability perspective. They, they, they struggle a little bit. And that reporting thing is interesting because that's, you know, now what we're being asked to do with materiality is to talk about yeah. how what we do is going to have an impact. Um, and I'm sure I know you, you, one of the things that you did, which um, 
when, when, when we were working through. And I should have said that both both Des and Peter have been through a, a Green Plus programs with Enterprise Ireland. Um, and I know you when you were going through it, one of the things that I thought was very effective around your implementation is that you didn't have the consultant um, build your pillars and you didn't have your, your you know consultant help you. you. You you gave the responsibility to the team to go off and come up with their sustainability plan. So strategy came from a top down, but but you yeah. had people bottom up. Do you, maybe we'll just talk about just that implementation piece for a minute. Very you, much so. So yes, we set the kind of broad parameters in the mission statement and strategy, but then we try to get people involved at a grassroots level. We define four pillars essentially under the environmental, social governance and solutions being our, as a client facing business. That was an important pillar to our uh, ambitions. And then we asked you know, people in, in, in our teams to come up with what they thought would be appropriate ambitions and targets for the uh, organization to put into our strategy. And we found that very impactful to really engage people from the grassroots level um, in building up our, our strategy. Yeah, I have to say it was one of the best sessions that I've been at where we were uh, fortunate to be invited along when those teams presented their plans. And mm. uh, it's very satisfying for us to see something that we might have seeded and then just see the actual team grab it. Because I think a lot of companies yeah. struggle with, with that embedding. So I might come back to your products and services after. I'm just going to come across to Des. Um, and you know, Des, you've been in the food and fresh food uh, business for years. I'm sure you've had retailers and customers and everybody asking you for information about the products and services. But you know, I ask you, what does what is, is sustainability in ESG reporting mean to you? And, and any perspectives on on some of the companies that you've worked with as to as to what's worked and what hasn't. Hi, Brian. Um, hello, everyone. Um, that's a good question, Brian. I think, first of all, sustainability is front and center of the FMCG environment and those major players within it, whether it's a retailer or whether it's a supplier to a retailer or whether it's a third party supplier coming through a, 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 a another business division within within Ireland. Um I can tell you that um probably over the last 12 months the interest in it has become quite intense. People, you know, you have retailers who are sending out um their own questionnaires wanting to know where are you on your journey. What are you doing about the big issue, which is climate? But also with regard to the other areas across AES and G. Um, and they are very interesting in how you're reporting this, how you're capturing this data, how, whether that data has been verified or not. And also in any reporting that you're doing, for example, if it's CDP, they're interested in your score and how you're going to improve that score over time. So it is front and center of everyone's mind. And I suspect as the trend is showing, they as time goes on, and when I say time, I'm not talking a long period away, I'm talking about you know, over the next 24 months, they will make greater decisions about where they place their business based on where you are in that maturity cycle. And uh, yeah, because that's really interesting. Um, um... I know traditionally supply chain and down the channel was a little bit peripheral in terms of, you know, we, we need to get our own house in order. But I think there seems to be a realization now by a lot of companies and maybe it's driven by science-based targets and things like that and maybe the due diligence directive. But there seems to be a, a recognition by an increasing recognition by companies that um, that their supply chains and, and even value chains, but particularly supply chains, what they buy, where they spend their money is key. Uh, uh, if you do, you want to just maybe talk to us a little bit about your view on on the on the supplier reporting side, because I think a lot of companies are at a very early stage with only thinking about how do, how do we maybe engage with our suppliers. Have you any any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I, I... As you know, I've been involved in the whole supplier engagement piece in my previous role with suppliers. And, you know, for your listeners, if they're looking for some advice, um, you, you need to understand where your, your supply base is in this journey. You need to maybe send out a survey to them. And, and 
you know, get to grips with the challenges that they are, have going on within their businesses and try and get some common ground in which you can start having conversations on. So once you know where your own business, the lay of the land of your own business is and the issues that are materially important to you and your customers, you also need to understand what are, of those material issues, which of them are important to your supply base. It is joined up thinking. You know, I have a view that if there is a, a head of lettuce coming from southern Spain, well, that head of lettuce is going to be sold at a retail store, so the retailer needs to be involved in that conversation. If I'm the importer for that head of lettuce, well, I need to be involved in the conversation. The person growing the head of lettuce um, in southern Spain needs to be uh, uh, involved in that conversation. And it's only by having that three-way conversation can you actually address the real issues at large and make some progress on them. And the challenge I see both in my current role and, and, and talking to people across the industry is being able to get that traction. How do you get the traction? And as I said, you know, I posted a thing um, today on, from Harvard Business Review. You know, sometimes good management practices is probably the thing that's getting in the road of that. You need to rethink how you're going to address this going forward. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good point because we, we we rush off to do stuff, but we actually don't think about the um, the implementation. I mean, one of the things that one of the the reasons and be, behind our recent deal is that, in my view, the conversations now are changing from you know companies looking to talk about their ambition and their sustainability credentials they now need to transition we now need to actually invest and we need to do stuff and without the management team making those commitments to the next level it's not going to happen it's going to need money there's a return and and you and I have talked and debated them many times the return on sustainability what is the return on sustainability because they're the question and if your business is able to talk about the impact that sustainability will have from a financial perspective on your business. T TCFD was a great piece of legislation in that perspective. It, it forced companies to put a measure on climate risk and opportunities. And I remember doing a, um, a session with a, again, I won't, I won't mention who it was, but it was a, a utility company in Ireland. And the CFO was in the room and we said, well, you're going to have to put a financial number and report a number on what climate means to your business, whether it's a risk or an opportunity. She said, well, we can't do that. I said, well, that's actually what the legislation is going to ask you to do. So from that governance perspective, Peter, if I could ask you, maybe move to the sort of the, the operational piece of this. Uh, I mean, you, you're, you guys are your auditors, your your accountants. So I guess uh, you know, numbers are what you do. When you, when you come to ESG and sustainability data, um, you know, they're not the same thing. They don't come from the same place. They're they're hidden in an organization. Can can you give me just give us a, a bit of perspective on 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 how, as an as an audit firm, you, you know, you, you're looking to sort of at your own ESG data and and, and how you manage mm -hmm. that. Uh, and then we we'll, we might talk about some of the products then that you have to help others. Yeah, sure, Brian. I think you know the the data challenges are huge in this, but it is necessary to keep a level head and, and really focus on what is material. And that, that I think is a key theme. You know, if you're looking at the very, very deep and wide disclosure requirements that are set out in the standard that, we, that we're all looking to, to comply with, you can very easily get um, overwhelmed. And so that step that you alluded to earlier on in actually understanding the impacts that your business has up and down the value chain and from your own activities and really focusing on those things that are material um, is a very important step for businesses to not get overwhelmed, to start somewhere, start at the most impactful areas and work your way through from there. But then understanding the, um, the amount of data that you might already have in your organization. So again, you know, the, the default is, oh my goodness, we're going to have to go out and collect a whole lot of new stuff. A lot of this data already exists in organizations. Um, and so an exercise to actually map out what are the requirements against what we already have, and then work on filling in the gaps. You know, taking a structured approach to this is, is how companies are going to find their way to a reasonable uh, first shot at their report, reporting. 
Um, and some of the, the auditors, you know, you have to take a reasonable first shot at this um, to make progress and not not go for the gold standard in year one. I think that's that's wow. important. Yes. I mean, we're all I frightened of the auditors, Peter. Um, you know, it's like, <laughs> we're not oh scary. God, I mean, they've got to go looking into our business. I, I think you made two, two brilliant points there. You, the, the, the first one is, let's look first at materiality, what's what's important. Yeah. And, and I think, um, you know, traditionally that wasn't, we like to get a set of, oh, here's the, you know, the SDGs, let, you know, look at how you, but look at the impact, look at where your organization has an impact first. And then in, in terms of the next thing, then go look at what data you have and do a bit of a gap assessment. So anybody who's starting the journey, I think they're two great starting positions to, to, to look at and do a bit of a gap assessment on data based on what's material, not on the thousands. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's lots of accountants and lawyers on the call, but we're finding that they're running around frightening the living daylights of everybody about the thousands of things that they might have to measure. You know, you mm. this is this is a journey. Start to like. I, I want you to just maybe once because there's one tool that you've developed, which is around the 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 audit uh, tool. So you you have an audit tool that helps companies to actually measure. Um, and I know it came out of the financial world, but it, it helps them to prepare for ESG audits. Do you just describe that briefly, maybe. Yeah. Chris? Thanks, Brian. Very briefly. So we looked at the um, ESRSs, that's the European Sustainability Reporting Standards, and identified that this is essentially a governance process that companies will need to go through to, to um, validate that they have complied with the standard. And we built a, a software product around that um, to help companies through the journey of verifying and uh, validating that they have complied with all the requirements. Um, and that helps kind of deal with this overwhelming sense that there's too much, um, you know, the, the task is too big. So we try to break it down into really um, manageable chunks that an organization can work through a very structured process, fill in the data and in the end, um, you know, generate a report that's supported by verifiable data that that the auditor can then look at and and reach a view on whether that is sufficient or not. And I we think, are I think that's that's going to be really a really useful um tool because I think you know the companies are focused on capturing the data, but we need to get it into a structured format so we can yeah. report it. And whether it's going to be in our annual report or some other, we don't know yet where we're going to have to disclose. We don't currently publish annual reports where we're putting this. So there's some interesting questions to be asked there. Um, Des, I know you 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 read a lot and you're you know you're you're always thinking about what's coming down what's coming down the track. Can I ask you what if you were to to advise people about what how should they think in businesses like you, you you've been involved with, which would be medium sized, medium to large Irish businesses. You know, having to having to answer to retailers and maybe banks and maybe investors as well. Like, what advice would you give to companies about how do they how to to grapple with all of this this data and reporting noise? Oh, that's a very good question, Brian. Again, um, I think um, first of all, you you need to decide where is it and what is it you want to go after. You know, I think a lot of people are so confused with the subject and so confused with how they, even how to go about trying to understand it, um, they end up doing nothing or they end up going in circles. So as as Dana White, the UFC president, says when he was asked, how did he build many billions pound company? He says, well, the first thing is I knew what I wanted to do and how I wanted to get there. So I think it's really important when it comes to your responsible business strategy that you have, you understand where that is and, and, and where is you want to get to. It's very important in small businesses, small medium enterprises, that the chief executive is on board in all of this. It's very important that they understand the challenges associated with the collecting the data and, and map out those challenges. You know. Um, We've had help in the past. I've had help in the past where consultancy firms have come in for us. And don't be afraid to use them if you can afford them, where they've simplified this stuff. 
they've you know they've said well listen here's the type of data that you if you're looking to go to cdp here's the requirements of cdp if you're looking to go to origin green for example here's the requirements and um obviously with the um the software solution that peter has um developed again that's another example of where you can outline what's required of you and then slowly break it down but you're going to require teams around this there's like there's you know, this is not a one or two individuals or the responsibility of head of operations. You need to have committees or you need to have a team around this that because you're going to be collecting data from inside your organization, but you're also going to be collecting data from outside your organization. What type of data are you going to ask from your supply base? Um, so um, I think you just need to simplify, understand where you want to get to within your strategy. Make sure your strategy is aligned to your commercial strategy because if it's not, it won't, it won't have great success. It just won't. Um, and then simplify the data. Understand what it is you need to do and then take your time in getting there. But as you said earlier on, Brian, you know, it's limited assurance starting off with um, and, and people just have to, you know, grapple with that in the context of their own business requirements. One other piece of advice I would give, and I've said this uh, before, when you're trying to get traction with your ESG strategy and the reporting requirements around this, if you find that you're not getting traction, one of the things generally happens, is, uh, and I'm seeing this constantly, is that it's not aligned to the business commercial strategy, it's not aligned to how the business actually is structured in the way it needs to be structured to compete in the marketplace that it competes in. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're, if, 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 if I does first, I'm a director of a company and my KPIs are, are against profit and growth and revenue. And you're giving me this whole strategy over here that says, well, actually you need to spend money over here and I'm not seeing the return on profit. The chances are inadvertently, I'm going to kill it because yeah. I'm KPI this direction. So yeah. um, I see that time and time again, and I think it's really important point that when people are trying to bring an ESG strategy to life and trying to understand the report requirements, please bear in mind that there is a commercial reality that it needs to enable and tie in with rather than sit alongside as something else. That that's a that's a brilliant point. And I, I I think my sense is that companies are spending all their time trying to figure out how to report, um, rather than spending some of that time figuring out how they need to change their approach, their yep. products, their operations, their investments to actually drive the transition. So, um, I, I I'm conscious, um, Kathleen, we we have some questions coming in, so I'm wondering whether. Uh, you want to fire those at us or I can read through some of them. Um, uh, yeah, look, uh, yeah, look, it'd be great to be able to continue on the, the discussion. Some really great insights there from, from you, Brian, and, and from Peter and from Des. But we, yeah, we, we might just go to the questions now and I see my colleague Ankush has been able to answer a few of them online, which is great. Um, so we'll just go through a few of the questions that are that are coming in because I think they'll be of interest to everyone. So the first one, I suppose, is just around um, ISO standards and how can they help with sustainability management, I suppose, in terms of the data, the governance, the reporting that's required for, for CSRD and for sustainability. You know, what will having ISO 14001 as an example or ISO 50001, um, how will that help, I suppose, in terms of the broader ESG reporting requirements that will be required under under CSRD. Yeah, I might, I might as I know both um, um both Peter and Des have worked in companies that that have ISO as as well as 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 in deep. So I think they're complementary would be on they just comment. I think they're complementary. They give a structure particularly to the implementation piece of of sustainability and that plan do check act that continuous improvement drive. But I don't know, Des, um, and, and uh, Des, yeah. Peter, any, any just comment from your perspective on ISO? Sure, sure, Brian. Um, I think ISOs are a brilliant tool to help you with your ESG strategy. As Brian's alluded to, um, you know, they spell out quite clearly what good governance looks like. Mm. Um, you know, if you're looking at 14,001, for example, you look at the environmental standard, you know, if you were to follow, um, you don't necessarily need to be accredited to standards, but if you take the best out of those standards and apply them to your business, you're now going to uh, be bringing into your organization 
good practice around reporting, around collection of data, um, around how you structure that within your organization. And all of that will complement what you're trying to do with regards to ESG and disclosure reporting, without a doubt. Yeah, yeah I would echo that, Brian. Uh, as part of our strategy to implement um, ESG in, in ISLAMPA, we have gained accreditation on ISO 14001, and it's really helped to structure the approach internally to um, to identifying and monitoring our environmental impact and how we filter that throughout the business. Yeah, yeah. And can, 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 can I just say one I, other I, thing about that? Um, in my experience, those that adopt ISO into their organization generally end up with a lower cost of operations. There you go. And we I say the same, it, yeah. yeah, like, you know, with ISO 50001, especially for, you know, large energy users, you know, it has been shown to deliver 10% annual savings by those continuous improvement activities. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, look, that, that's, that's great. And um, that's great feedback, I think, for the audience today. Yeah, just to point on it, I think there's a change. People used to think that the ISO badge would get you more. I mean, it may there, and there may still be tenders and requirements, but I think the benefits now are moving away from just the badge to mm. the actual benefits of implementation, so. Yeah, um, so we have another question then around kind of courses and certifications. And, and, and I suppose, look, it'd be great to be able to say today, yeah, go and do X course and, you know, you, that will then help you be a, a, an ESG reporter or a practitioner, um, you know, relevant to the kind of CSRD and EU regulations. I will just flag that we do have a webinar on the 18th of October on skills, and we'll have um, Skillnet speaking at that event around their broad range of programs in relation to sustainability, in particular their Climate Ready Academy. Um, and we also will have the Irish Universities Association talking about their microgrids programs. And I know a lot of the universities and technical universities have have courses, um, you know, and they're online now, short courses, so really relevant to this area. So any feedback um, from yourselves, Justin, perhaps what courses what courses would be applicable here? Um, yeah, go ahead, Des. Yeah, um, that's an interesting question as well, because it really depends where you are within the area of responsibility. So um I, I think organizations there, there's 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 you know if you go into the, an organization that's 250 employees and say that's a, a food manufacturer ready meals and I'm 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 creating the example here. Um the people on the floor will want to know where you're going to um as an organization and where you want to get to. So there's a level of upskilling and knowledge so they feel they they can contribute in some small way. If you're then getting into managers of sustainability and leadership teams or committees, um, you can again use. Um, I would I would highly recommend Clearstream. Um, they have fantastic tr uh, training uh, programs around that, and that will allow you to upskill in a very short period of time something that's bespoke to your organization. Now, if you're into a board. Uh, level and um, a director level, you might want to take on a more of accredited program. I myself am doing a PGC with Trinity, for example, to upskill my, my own further knowledge. So the, depending on where you sit within the organization and what your role is within the strategy, there's many options out there for you. Thanks, Des. And look, I'm I'm conscious, Des, that it's two uh, coming up to two o'clock, so you might have to you have a hard stop at two. Yeah, I, I, I'm I, I'm going to jump, so I'll have yeah. to leave for my next meeting. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much soon. for joining us. Yeah. Bye, 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 bye. Hopefully, Peter and Brian will be able to stay on for for a few yep. more minutes. Yep. <laughs> um. So we'll just move on to the next question, I suppose. And this question is from a small business. Um. And it's just in relation to, I suppose, what should they focus on, on 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 maybe first? So for a small business that needs to make sure that being behind on sustainability progress does not become a bottleneck for sales, are there specific areas that one should focus on? I.e., are there any specific area or questions that larger companies will be asking smaller companies in the supply chain? I suppose I'll just kind of maybe give a few examples of what we're seeing, I suppose, from our client companies is that the first place for a lot of companies to focus on is energy. Um, in terms of it's something that's easily measured, it's something that, you know, your own energy usage you have direct control on, and there's obviously companies now are, are you know, having to try and deal with high energy costs. 
and a lot of customers are in their, in and then when they're looking at the supply chain, the first questions that they do ask generally around what's your carbon reduction plan, what actions have you implemented, or what actions are you planning to to, to implement? So that's kind of the, the the first kind of starting point. But I think what's clear from today's webinar is that you know it's more than energy; it's the broader sustainability, it's the you know it's the environmental, the social, and and, and the governance. So um, I'll hand over perhaps to to, to Brian or to Peter for for your views on that. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think for, for small businesses, I would say to, 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 it's carbon and climate is probably the, the number one you have to prepare for. And I think you should also, something with regard to, to your your employee um, piece, I think is, is very critical, just to show that you're, you are engaging in some form of wellness in uh, program training, engagement with your employees. I think if I was a buyer, I, I would be able to, cover the fact that you know you, you don't maybe have massive investments or big supply chain impacts but i want to know that your, your your people are well and happy and i'd want to know that you're doing something to address climate change i i would say increasingly um if you think of most small companies actually tend to be a lot more agile than big corporates um and small companies actually can find sustainability angles and stories and solutions and innovations in a way that big companies can't. Um, so I think um, if I was advising small companies, I'd say find out, back to the materiality thing that Peter talked about, find out something that you do that's special that others don't do as well or that some advantage that you have from a sustainability perspective and be able to talk to your customers about that because as we discussed you are in their sustainability, you're in their scope three, you're in their sustainability reporting requirements. And if you can provide something that helps your your customers to improve their sustainability, happy days, we're winning. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah I agree. Yeah, right. So sorry. very quickly, I, I, what I would advise also is just to pick up the phone to your two or three key customers and ask them what's important to them in the sustainability journey, because you could, it could be a big differentiator for you, that's you know, really as a small advice. business. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's really good advice, um, Peter and, and Brian. And a follow on from that, I suppose, just as a question in on, the, on this kind of social side, I suppose, um, how do you, how are companies currently, you know, uh, measuring social outcomes for reporting? Is this something that you see? Yeah, um, great question. I, I think the workplace stuff tends to be, um, relatively straightforward. I want to say it's ge gender gap, it's diversity, it's training, it's it's health, well, healthness, wellness, health. Um, some of the external stuff becomes a little bit uh, more challenging. Um, there is a process, and I'm not overcomplicating it, and I think it's going to come here. It's a thing called a social value impact. Um, and in the UK, uh, any tenders above five million uh, pounds sterling issued by the UK government have to provide a social value impact. So you have to measure the impact that your business and this project is going to have on society. So are you contributing to employee, you know, more employees? Are you contributing to training of society? Are you recruiting people with disabilities or maybe more diverse? So you're asked to actually put numbers on the impact that your project is going to have in terms of social. And I think that's something that we'll increasingly see coming into the decisions being made with tenders, because we'll know we have a negative environmental impact with carbon, but actually we may be helping the well-being of society. So we're, we are starting to see companies try to understand what are the wider social impacts that they're having um, in terms of business. So a little bit more difficult to calculate, but there are tools, the UK government provides a tool out there to actually do that calculation. It tends to be based on spend and economic impact, but that translates into, into social impact. Great, and as we just have a, a comment in there that SROI is in place in Ireland, it's called Social Value Ireland, and there's a, a practitioner pathway. So, um, so I, look, I, yeah. I did hear that, and I was going to mention, but except somebody told me that it was winding up, but I'm not sure that's probably fake news. So yeah. I hope it is, because I think it's a brilliant initiative. Brilliant, yeah, something to, to, to definitely check out. Um, so look, before we before we move on and um, and wrap up, uh, there's just a question, Peter, for you in terms of the software tool that you um, mentioned. Perhaps you could just give maybe a little bit more information on that. 
Yeah, so it's not uh, publicly launched yet. It will be uh, in the coming months. But at this stage, we are very happy to talk one-on-one -on -one with potential clients on a on a you know kind of bespoke basis. So if anyone wants to reach out to me directly, we will happy to have a discussion about it uh, pending a a public launch in the months to come. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think the, the 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 point about it, Kathleen, this key is that people need to think not just about how they they actually collect the data and how it's going to, but how it's actually yeah. going to report it and audit it. I think that's key. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, look, that's absolutely brilliant. And look, thank you, Brian, and thank you, you Peter, and and Des as well for joining us today. I think that was just like really informative and and insightful for for our uh, audience. Um, so look, we we leave it at that. I know there's a few more questions in the Q and A, but look, we we leave it at that in the interest of time. Um, I'm just going to share my screen again. Um, so just give me a moment. I just like to share the uh, our next webinar, which is I think a very good follow on um from today's webinar. Um, so we just should be able to see my screen there. That's so. Yes. It, yeah, great. So this is just um yeah, we're showing you our, our webinar series. So we started off with what does a climate action journey look like? Um and today we, we've heard all about sustainability reporting and, and ESG. So next week our webinar is focusing again on, I suppose, look the sustainability reporting, the changing regulations. So there will be a big focus on CSRD and also then on the business focus um on net zero emissions, but not only net zero emissions, it's the broader sustainability, ESG and net zero and net zero. So we will hear from Ingrid to Donker of Future Planet on the changing policy and regulatory requirements. And we'll hear from Sheila O'Loughlin, who is a senior market advisor in the Enterprise Ireland London office. And Sheila will be able to share examples of the increasing business focus on um from corporate customers and 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 you know government agencies and others on sustainability and net zero emissions. So that'll be from the UK market. We then have a webinar on skills as I mentioned and finally then we we'll have another webinar then on, on the circular economy and closing the circular or closing circular uh, innovation gap. So I'd also just uh, like to bring to everyone's attention that um, we are launching a new sustainability Kickstarter workshop. And um, this will be, you know, target participants here are business leaders in SMEs. It will be a half day workshop and the aim is to like engage as many companies to highlight the importance of sustainability and ESG in their in their strategy, in their business strategy. And one of the expected outcomes of this half day workshop will be you know, an initial sustainability or ESG action plan. It's open to two participants from each company. And you can see our key dates there in terms of the first one is going to be on the 27th of October. It'll be, we'll have five workshops from the end of October to the end of the year, and it's open to Enterprise Ireland and local Enterprise Office clients. So if this is something that you're interested in, we do ex expect, I suppose, look, a, a big uptake and, in, and interest in the program, contact your, your development advisor or your local Enterprise Office advisor. So finally, then, and just in terms to, to highlight again, I suppose, look, the supports that are available for companies, whether they're an Enterprise Ireland client, a local Enterprise Office client, if you're a client of the IDA or UDROS, contact your element agency as well. But to start out, a really good place for companies is to is the Climate Toolkit for Business, which is a government initiative to calculate your carbon footprint, to understand, you know, what is your carbon footprint and to develop an initial action plan. It also helps you understand the funding landscape. Then keep in mind your sustainability uh, Kickstarter workshop and also SAI supports who and SAI have a free online energy trading academy and also a voucher for companies for SMEs with an energy spend of greater than 10,000 euro per annum to do to do an energy audit. So that's for companies that are beginning starting out in this journey. And then we have a range of supports from a two day climate action voucher to develop your sustainability or decarbonization plan from Green Start to introduce best practice systems, Green Plus to really embed you know, management capabilities aligning to the international standards that were discussed today and really building those in-house capabilities and strategic consultancy to develop a carbon reduction roadmap for, for large or complex energy users. There are a range of supports then in terms of investing in decarbonization from meters and putting in electricity, you know, water, gas, steam meters. There's a 50% grant there to, to install meters. There's a grant to decarbonize manufacturing heating processes. And we also have an environmental aid fund, which is a large capital fund to really transform 
I suppose, decarbonisation and, and an environmental um, projects for companies to, to really kind of fund those really big transformative projects. SAI have a range of supports from their community exceed scheme, from their solar um, uh, grants to electric vehicles. But to truly transform, I suppose it is about collaborating, it is about innovating your business model, your, your product or your service. So keep in mind the RDNI supports are there and then the European funding, the technology centres and, and the clusters and really collaborate with, with all stakeholders as has, has been mentioned today. So I'm conscious of time now, so look for more information, go to our globalambition.ie Green Transition Fund webpage, contact your development advisor or your agency advisor or email green at enterprise-ireland.com. So look, thank you very much for joining today and we will be sharing the recording and slides um, after. Thank you, bye-bye.